Shalom and welcome to another episode of TV7 Editor's Note. I'm Jonathan Hassan, of course, and with me, two of our distinguished guests, but more so um, regulars, uh, if I may, uh, the co-panelists on TV7 Europa Stands, Dr. Rafael Baldachi, a former national security advisor of uh, Spain and uh, CEO of Worldwide Strategy. Of course, we have also Colonel Richard Kemp, uh, the jewel of uh, the program, some may say. Uh, I heard a few Brits coming out with that term. Uh, former Advice. field commander, chief of intelligence, or the chairman of the, the uh, Commission of Intelligence on COBRA, and uh, so much more. Uh, it's a pleasure having you both here on the program. Of course, you've both been here on the program via uh, Zoom or Skype or whatever method we use uh, in order to partake in an uh, individual manner. Uh, but uh, how about we open with prayer and then we'll dive into a discussion on a uh, different number of issues. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to uh, once again host uh, both uh, Richard uh, Camp and uh, Rafael Baradahi uh, for yet another episode of uh, TV7 Editor's Note. Lord, I pray that you will guide and lead every word that we say and that whatever we do and say in this discussion will truly impact the nations for your name's sake. We give you all glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Dr. Baradahi, uh, we'll start with you. Uh, you're both here, of course, for uh, the uh, Friends of Israel initiative, which uh, you lead, um, and it, it is uh, quite a unique uh, initiative at that, uh, that you bring here top diplomats uh, from uh, various countries, leaders, top military officers, and uh, provide them briefings and, and more much more that we won't discuss on, on air, of course, um, in order to truly impact the nations for the sake of uh, the security of Israel, for the peace of Jerusalem, something that not every individual can say, uh, to say the least. Uh, but this service is truly making a difference for Israel. And therefore, I'd, I'd like to hear your perspective on um, what is the driving force behind this, how does this impact also your nations back home? Yeah, well, let me start by saying that we all, we are involved in the Friends of Israel initiative. We do believe that uh, if Israel goes down by any chance, we, as the Western civilization, will follow and we will fall down together. That's our, probably our main strategic premises for what we would like to see and strong, vibrant, dynamic, and democratic Israel. Uh, in, in the region, no? and playing for good, as always. Uh, having said that, what we do basically is engage uh, peers in governments or in major corporations that have some dealings with the, uh, the State of Israel and try to present our voice as non-Jewish, but uh, people with experience in different fields, foreign, foreign minister, defense minister, commanders in the field, chief of staff, national security advisors, uh, to engage them in a, in a private, direct, and frank conversation to make the debate on Israel less irrational, less passionate, and more focused on common interests. No? That's what we wanted from the very beginning of Friends of Israel Initiative 11 years ago, and that's what they've been doing and we will try to continue doing in, in, for the sake of the state of Israel, but for our own security as well. Brilliant. One of uh, the distinguished uh, individuals partaking in this initiative is, of course, Colonel Kemp. Uh, we won't discuss much about Europe in this um, uh, broadcast uh, edition because in just a couple of hours uh, we will air uh, our uh, first edition for 2023 of TV7 Europa. Stan, stay tuned. Uh, Rafael, uh, Richard, and I will be joined by Timo. Uh, Soini, the former foreign minister of Finland, and uh, by uh, Uri Rosenfeld, the former foreign minister of the Netherlands, to communicate about the current state of play of, of Europe uh, within the so tough environment that uh, Europe finds itself uh, today. So we will uh, teleport ourselves there. No, uh, we will actually, uh, this is pre-recorded, uh, as the Israel Friends Initiative is currently in Israel, we found the opportunity to record three episodes Last week, of course, you had uh, a larger group. This week, we have uh, Dr. Bardahi once more, and then 
uh, Richard uh, Kemp has also joined us. And next week we'll have, once again, uh, Mr. Baird and Mr. Soini to speak about about foreign policy. Two top diplomats, one of Helsinki, the other one of Canada. Both are quite familiar with the situation here in Israel and beyond. Um, but at that, Colonel, what is your experience here partaking with the Israel Friends Initiative? Uh, you're no stranger to Israel, of course. No, I'm very fortunate in visiting Israel pretty frequently and have done for many years now. Um, we, 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 I think, are very lucky in Friends of Israel Initiative in having some pretty strong access to high-level policymakers, officials, military people, intelligence people here in Israel, and we've, they've been very generous with their time. Of course, it works to their advantage as well, because as Raphael explained, our, our role really is to try and bring some kind of objectivity and, and um, uh, influence on existing governments to get away from the emotion and get re, you know, re, deal with Israel according to realities as we understand them. And so it works in both our, uh, for, for both sides. We also, I think I'd make the point that um, the Middle East is obviously an extremely important region for, the, for Europe and for the world, particularly given its energy resources and the implications of conflicts here in the Middle East, including on immigration into Europe, um, and so, which, which obviously has a major impact on national economies and, and security. Yeah. Um, and... and we see, I certainly see Israel as being absolutely fundamental to the security of the Middle East. Some people will argue that Israel is a problem to Middle Eastern security. I would argue the opposite, that Israel is fundamental. And, and, and I think we're seeing that. We've seen that in recent years even more than before with the Abraham Accords, with the, the, uh, the, the very increasingly close cooperation between Middle Eastern countries, Arab countries, and Israel and and hopefully those accords will develop further uh, and and perhaps strengthen Israel in its uh, desire to uh, to to protect itself and to protect the Middle East from the real threat to uh, security in this region which is of course Iran absolutely uh, you know when when we look at Israel uh, people seem to forget that one third of crude oil and LNG passes through the waterways adjacent to uh, Israel, to uh, Egypt, Yemen, and, and all those territories. Uh, you know, the Houthis, which are actually a very small, relatively small tribe uh, in Yemen, uh, have managed to build up various alliances and grow and grow and grow into, uh, they call themselves the Ansarullah, uh, which is an Iranian proxy. They are trained, they are funded, they are uh, equipped. Uh, the United States and the United Kingdom, by the way, have been very instrumental in thwarting smuggling efforts from Iran into Yemen. Thousands of weapons were seized time and again, and yet Iran is not being um, treated in a fair manner. And when I say Iran is not treated in a fair manner, it's far worse than what people are making it to be. Why is that, Dr. Barduki? Especially when we look at the governments in Europe and we ask mm. ourselves, where is the leadership? Well, unfortunately, in many parts of the world today, there are weak leaders with no strategic experience, even less military experience whatsoever, and that try to avoid looking directly into potential conflicts. Uh, in the case of Iran, there are also uh, energy and economic and trade related issues that make less palatable for many to take a strong position against Iran, and particularly on the sanctions side. But I think uh, there has been some evolution lately, you know. We have seen so many cracks by the by the uh, regime, crackdowns of different demonstrations at different times. Now we are seeing the seven months uh, of demonstration against the regime, fundamental values and nature. Uh, we have seen in Europe the intervention of Iran with terrorist cells all in many all across the, the, the continent, from Germany to Denmark to Spain to Italy. And lately, in the last month, we have seen uh, the progressive involvement directly 
into the Ukrainian war, helping the Russians to target civilians in Ukraine, so an infrastructure. So I think uh, that there is a perception which is changing slowly, not yet what we want to see, which is a stronger position against the regime in Tehran. But uh, I think with, over time, we will try to help that this vision of uh, Iran as a, as a devil actor uh, in, the, in, the re- in this region, but also in the world, Will, will will be accomplished. No? Uh, we will expand more about uh, the the European angle to, mm-hmm. to this matter uh, in just a couple of hours in our program in Europa Stands, uh, which will be recorded from Helsinki, of course. But I'd like to ask you, as somebody who advised three defense ministers and NATO, and, and I won't go through your entire CV no. curriculum vitae uh, for good reason, because we will not have any time left. (laughs) Uh, But where is the disconnect between advisors providing accurate intelligence and warning their leaders and leaders just taking that information and not implementing it in the best interests of their own country? There are many reasons, but essentially no leader today in Europe wants to be dragged into uh, open conflict with anyone actually, unless with a far distant country like Iran, where we have in, the, in between the Israelis that we believe it will take action in, on behalf of our interest at, at, at the latest. Uh, second, I think uh, there is a, a distrust on intelligence, given some fail, recent failures of providing advice to the prime ministers. and. And finally, I think all the security domain has been much more politicized. Uh, it's not like, a, like, like in, during the Cold War that you can really present a case and you will be heard and act accordingly, politically speaking. Now, you know, they are much more short-term oriented and problems that are two years ahead are a kind of eternity for a po- current politician. So altogether, it's a mix of cocktails of things uh, which make it very difficult for them to focus on realistic issues. No? But Having said that, we are reaching a point, probably the next year, when they have to take a, a reality test. The Iranians will have reached the point where there is no return uh, from the nuclear program, and that will be a catastrophe. So at a certain point in 2024, uh, they will have to take the political leader, they will tackle the decision whether to allow Iran to become nuclear or to present a common front to put more pressure on Iran for them to abandon the idea. That will be the acid test of reality for any government. No, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Colonel Camp, you've been obviously a senior field commander for many years and commanded uh, British forces in Afghanistan amongst others. Uh, And uh, I'm, I'm gonna throw at you a tricky question because we both know the answer of this, but has wokeism infiltrated the armed forces in a manner that impacts decision making and translating uh, the information from the ground to the political leadership, ultimately? Uh, it has, and it's 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 not just military. Surprised. But, yeah, <laughs> right. Not just yeah. military commanders and staffs, but also civil servants and other government advisors, etc. Um, th- I think they're... Who want to keep their positions pretty they, much. They want to keep their positions. And, and actually, in many cases, in, in different armies, including the British Army, I've seen cases of generals who are more politically correct than any politician. Uh, And actually, in my experience, working um, in the Prime Minister's office, in the Cabinet office in the UK, uh, bizarrely, uh, when it came to military action, discussions of military action, it was the military that was most reluctant to put forward options on the table. How can you explain that? Because they... they, they (laughs) I think I think the in the cases that I've been involved with, they wanted to be seen to be kind of peace loving. Their job, they, of course, they of course you know they, there is a saying that that soldiers hate war more than anybody else because they actually experience it. But their job, these people's job, is to put forward military options to politicians. Whether the military options are adopted or not is the matter, a decision for politicians. Right but they have to put those options forward. I've seen cases where they refuse to put options forward, reluctant to put options forward, and actually have to be pushed by, bizarrely, the civil servants and the uh, officials in the foreign office. We, to- we just heard Dr. Baradakhi, and sorry I'm interjecting here, um, speak about 
the fact that you know it's been politicized yeah. the security establishment to what degree has that impacted western capacity to react to a threat like iran i think i think it has a major influence and you just have to look at um you know the the reality of the threat that iran poses those of us around this table can understand it and can see it and of course military people in every country can see it clearly as well but they don't want to see it in many cases they don't want to be the person that suggests that actually maybe israel is in the right in this case and maybe iran is in the wrong they don't want to be the person that 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 you know could take some kind of responsibility for pushing the button on uh, on uh, at least supporting israel or maybe even carrying out operations against iran and, and like, as i said i've seen personal i've had personal experience of a reluctance of british military people to take act to take military action against iran then when they were killing our troops and you just have to look at i mean it's slightly tangential but you just have to look at the recent bizarre balloon scenario in the united states of america where apparently according to reporting military people generals said that oh this is fine what you know the fact that trump allowed this balloon, the sorry that biden allowed this balloon to traverse the whole of the united states before shooting it down that's fine because trump did the same and it turns out he didn't do the same it was there was nothing remotely like this that occurred under trump but the, it, we found military members of military organization in the us covering for biden's uh, failure to take action Unbelievable. Well, at least it provided the Raptor 22 uh, an operational success uh, during its uh, long-lived years. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Paradaki, when we're talking about this, it's alarming. It seems like we look at a situation, we have logic, we have rationale, we understand how the system operates, but it seems like leaders are no more than appeasers of public opinion these days. Yeah, indeed. Uh, I think when I started my career many, many decades ago, I always remember that we had sticks and carrots. The stick has been shrinking and shrinking and shrinking, and the carrots have been mm. growing, growing, and growing. Uh, to the extent that we have losing muscle to be credible enough to present a threat to our enemies. Uh, that's a, a reality, it's a fact. Uh, and, and, uh, and because every day you are weaker, you cannot present a narrative to your public which is stronger because the dissonance will be perceived very clearly and very fast. So all the all the narratives on the foreign front are appeasing, appeasing, appeasing in the hope that the crocodile don't will ask for more meat and don't will eat your hand. Uh, I think they are wrong, and we will be suffering in the future. We have to confront a real enemy and a real threat no? directly. Uh, but uh, it is impossible, really. I don't have any answer how to transform the political strategic culture of today into a much more realistic approach to foreign and security policy. You know, I think Margaret Thatcher said it beautifully about uh, uh, liberal leaders, uh, the left, uh, who, you know, uh, push but, so but, strongly but, on socialism. But, but, but that's why, it's, to me, it's so important to have a strong military capable Israel because it's the only piece we have to look at the mirror of how right. weak we have become. Right. No, absolutely. Um, unfortunately, I think also the the, um, the 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 kind of I suppose pro whether you call it propaganda or um, political program to determine that all cultures are equal, and that you know the. the the, the cultures in the Middle East of Arab countries, of Iran, etc., are just as strong as Western cultures, and they're equal. They're not. There's no difference. I think that has led to many officials and 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 policymakers and military people as well to 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 fail to understand the reality of these cultures and what these cultures really mean. And the fact that you know we would we we probably in the UK would 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 never consider using nuclear weapons except as a deterrent except in response to an attack and therefore iran wouldn't consider it either and, and i think it's just a failure to understand the re the reality of the cultures are not the same uh whether people like to 
acknowledge it or not. No. Um, unfortunately, it's being educated this way in, yeah. in schools in the West uh, and also in Israel, by the way, that cultures are very similar and they uh, are diver- uh, verging in all kinds of ways. Uh, you know, when, when you hear, I, I've been in so many meetings behind closed doors um, and, and elsewhere, also in, in social gatherings, where the only language spoken was Arabic and, and no foreigners, so to speak, were around. Uh, except for moi. Um, but, you know, you hear them speak in such a condescending manner about Western civilization and Western culture and, and how that they're already defeated. It's all, man, all a matter of time, you know? Yeah, well, I think it's important to remind the words of historian Arnold Toynbee, you know, who said, civilization don't die from external threats, but from committing suicide, you know? Because people don't tend to not to take seriously the, the damage done in this peace-loving, appeasing, woke uh, mentality. And uh, it's permeating everything because there is no short-term cost, you know? But in reality, it's a medium and long-term, very dramatic cost that we are going to put ourselves. Uh, and we are shooting not our feet, uh, we are shooting our heads, you know? And uh, it's a matter of time, and that's why we need to fight this culture or country culture, country civilization, country Western values, because if not, we are doomed. Well, uh, you know, they say Rome didn't fall in one day, but it fell quite, uh, it didn't get built in one day, but Rome fell in 75 years. 75 years is not that much, yeah. you know, and, and unfortunately you're looking around today and uh, the reasons Rome fell, of course, different period, uh, different uh, scenarios, but the essence I identify a lot of wokeism in that era, comparative to that era. Uh, we have roughly five minutes, and and you know when when I really look at the whole picture and and I try to identify. You, you mentioned something very important, and that is Israel is a mirror for for the West for for the world basically when it comes to uh, a Western civilization, so to speak. Um, fighting for its survival and not only for its survival for the essence of the identity of a nation state something that when you speak about the definition of a nation state in the uk you're immediately rendered a racist uh same in in spain same in um the united states and anywhere else well the united states is of course uh, a nationality more uh, but is this one of the key ingredients or the key reasons for the 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 bashing of Israel as as a racist state because it was erected for the sole purpose of um, protecting the nation, uh, the Jewish people, and allowing them for self determination in their ancestral homeland, the land of the Bible, which we, you know, this is the foundation for all of us ultimately. Mm-hmm. Well, I think from a European perspective, there are three major reasons why many people hate Israel. Uh, one is because Israel is based on a clear identity, while in Europe we are all multicultural and we base our own identity as a Western uh, society. Second is a religious state oriented to the Jewish people. And uh, we are all, except uh, religious in Europe, we, we believe in everything, so we believe in nothing, actually. Uh, and finally, Israel has proved that it's able and willing to defend itself, while we are pacifist to the extreme that we, we better surrender, as a Spanish defense minister, I better be surrendering than uh, fighting the enemy. You know, this is the mentality, and those three major pillars are probably the, the, the basis for uh, from what anti-Israel and anti-Semitism to some extent is based nowadays in Europe. Uh, but I probably am the only one living under uh, a country with, in a country with has a Caligula as a prime minister. Uh, so I think I understand in my own flesh and blood uh, what it is, this woke mentality. And uh, it's a terrible thing that only, only can really harm uh, our way of life, our values and our beliefs. Well, look at your prime minister rubbing shoulders with Maduro and all yeah, kind of yeah. uh, dictators that are, are truly horrendous to their own population in so many ways. Uh, I, don't think, I don't think we should forget also where the the anti-Israel feeling in the West comes from. And it, I think it, the, all of the factors Rafael mentioned are absolutely correct. I agree with it. But 
that we should we shouldn't forget it originates in its modern uh, sense with with Russia, with Russia's intention to uh, to to bring conflict into the land of Israel with the KGB in the lead um, after after Israel decided to be on the side of the US and the West. And, the, and, and in the process of that, the KGB created, along with Egypt, created the, the Palestinian national cause, the PLO, and, and the propaganda and the, um, the, the anti-Israel feeling that they sowed around the world. And, and, and it's not just the anti-Israel feeling, of course. We should, a lot of the wokeism we've been talking about and the anti-nationalism we've been talking about in European countries and in the US is also a, re a result of, of work done by Russia all those years ago. I, Soviet I think Union. many people um, uh, will be astounded at this moment hearing this because uh, many people would render this, you know, a conspiracy. But uh, the archives are being published. Obviously, you've been already exposed to the archives when they were not archives. But um, these archives are being uh, made public, so everybody can go and, and yeah. read about the influences. There are people who've been here in Israel, incarcerated, people that uh, uh, have been, uh, there is black tape, the, the information that is being diverted to the leaders. Um, things are being omitted from certain ministers and, and senior government officials who are being suspected of being agents of Russia here in Israel. So uh, this is not far-fetched at all. Um, and unfortunately, uh, it is a problem for counterintelligence to deal with. And it's uh, something that is uh, being uh, pursued very vigorously. Um, but yeah, no, it's for no reason. Uh, all of the Palestinian leadership studied in Russia um, and was very active uh, on multiple levels uh, in uh, the whole aspects of also establishing here the Communist Party in Israel and so on and so forth. But we have to leave some for a couple of hours from now uh, to discuss uh, European affairs. Uh, it's been a pleasure, really. Uh, Colonel Likewise. Camp, Dr. Bardaki, um, and uh, for all of you, hopefully, uh, we were able to benefit you in some way today, uh, being informative uh, on so many levels. Uh, I at least enjoyed it, so indeed. Thank you. Until next time, Shalom.